but everything should be fine now um i have been looking very much forward to today because today we're going to talk about a topic which is very much up in the time and um, we're going to be talking about the queen's gambit accepted um, and since the whole series with the queen's gambit then of course this queen's gambit accepted is um is quite popular at the moment and i think that we should just uh get started my name is uh, Ellen Frederica Nielsen. I'm a WFM, a woman feeder master from Denmark, and I am streaming both live on Coach's Twitch channel and on the Chess24 YouTube channel. If you have any questions, anything you're in doubt of, um, something you want to know, I am reading both chats simultaneously. I have them both right in front of me. Um, I already see some people that I recognize with some emotes. That's very nice to see. So feel free to ask anything. Let's try to keep it. Uh, let's try to keep the questions around chess today. Um, and then I think that we should just get started. But I should also tell that I will be uploading the file that I made on this opening to my discord channel um which you can find on my own streaming channel Ellen Nilsson on Twitch and it will go in the sub only uh part of the Twitch channel so you have to be a part uh you have to be a sub to my channel and then I will upload the file there and you can find it and you can download it whenever you want um <laughs> Yes, of course, me reading the chat simultaneously are going to be better than when I play chess against people simultaneously. We will be looking at a game today to hopefully improve our understanding of the Queen's Gambit accepted. And we will be looking at the game Atalic versus Sleepak from Mar del Plata in 2003. So this is a very, um, this is quite an old game. I wouldn't say it's a very old game, but 17 years is still quite a bit. But I think this game really well, well shows some of the basic strategic ideas and some uh, of the mistakes that you could that your opponent could easily make when they are playing um, the queen's gambit accepted against you so of course we start with the move 1d4 there are no other well <laughs> we could also go c4 and after this we would transpose but 1d4 is the is the way to get into this Queen's Gambit accepted. And then here, black plays d5 and white plays c4. And this is called a gambit, even though many people, um, rightly so, they do not consider it a gambit because in a gambit you usually sacrifice a pawn. But in this Queen's Gambit, you very, very often, um, you very, very often get it back. And we are of course looking at the queen's gambit accepted, which means that black will take the pawn just like this with the d takes c4. And in this position, white actually has quite a few options. Um, <laughs> are you more, li more likely to respond to questions if I ask on both YouTube and Twitch? Uh, depends on the question. Depends on the question. I'm sorry, my nose is a bit itchy. itchy. Depends on the question. Um, there are many ways that white can play in this position. I will show uh, very few of the ways that white can play. The main line we will be looking at today is e3. And e3 is an old favorite of mine. I have been playing this ever since I was a little girl. And I will also tell you why that I have become so fond of this um, passively seeming move, which uh, which isn't so which it, which isn't uh, that passive. Um, the sharpest way to continue the game is to go e4, taking control of the center directly, and this can lead to very sharp games. Um, 
after e5 and knight f3, e takes d4, bishop takes c4, and knight c6, this is indeed a pawn sacrifice. Um, and white in these lines try to prove compensation for the pawn. There is also a very known drawing line after e4, if black plays knight f6 in this position. The draw is in no way forced. Um, both players can deviate at certain points. But this drawing line has been played many, many times. And I have also played this once with black against my dad. Um, so it can be played if you want to. I just want to show it because these drawings li drawing lines and traps in the opening are always very nice to know. After e5 attacking the knight, black goes into the center. White takes back the pawn. Black drops back, attacking the bishop on c4, which white then drops back. Black develops, white develops, and then black pins the knight. Please also do let me know if it's going a bit too fast and you can't uh, keep up. This line I'm not going to go uh, deep into. I'm just going to, to show the drawing line. We will be taking the other moves a bit slower than this. I just want to show it on the board because here black, uh, white can actually play a very beautiful move, knight g5. At first point, at first sight, it seems like you are losing the queen on d1, um, and and black probably has to take the queen because. The queen is attacking the bishop here. If you don't, if you don't take the queen, um, then white is attacking the bishop, and white is also attacking the pawn on f7. So black has to take the bishop, but now after bishop takes f7 and king d7, white doesn't have a mate, um, and white did indeed sacrifice a whole queen. White has to play bishop e6 to to prevent this king from going to c8. The king has to drop back and again white has to give a check here there's no way to to make black and if you do anything else like taking the bishop here then this king will find its way out of the danger zone um, after a move like queen takes d4 check and black is very much indeed winning um so this draw will just this move repetition will uh, will keep on happening um you're not able to comment on the youtube chat that is that is very much uh that is weird i do not know why that is you should be able to maybe if you try refreshing um so this is a very known drawing line that i just wanted to show which happens after three e4 and uh, knight f6 it can happen doesn't necessarily happen then there's also the main line, which is uh, which is knight f3 in this position. Um, and knight f3 can or very often transposes to the line that we will be looking at with e3. Here, um, here black plays knight f6 most of the time, mainly to stop this e4, e4 push. So now white cannot play e4 anymore and can and will once again go for e3. Here, which is a difference to the line that we will be looking at, black can play bishop to g4. Um, bishop to g4 here, which isn't possible when we play 3 e3. Uh, and I will I will show that later. And after bishop takes c4, e3. White actually has a very good score in this line. You go h3 and the bishop has to drop back to h5. Um, black does not want to give up the bishop here on f3 as the queen will the queen will take, if I could be allowed to take, please, thank you. The queen will take, and this is just a very good position for white, getting, the, getting black's light squared bishop for free already putting pressure down on this b7 pawn, ready to castle, um, initiative in the center after knight f3, and soon e4 might also be played. 
Um, but today, as I said before, I just wanted to show some alternatives in case you do not like what uh, we are going to witness. But I can pro well, I can tell that I very, very much like these lines. Um, why no knight c3 preparing e4? I'm sorry, cranky monkey. I didn't see your 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 text before now. In which position did you mean? Um, you can you this uh, video will of course also be uploaded to the Chess Twenty Four YouTube, so you can rewatch this video, rewatch the moves and the explanations when we are done today. But I won't. Be, uh, I can show the drawing line quickly again, but it's not too important and also both players can deviate can deviate uh, during the game. So um, it's not uh, I, I, the drawing line was mostly just um, mostly just to show. but the drawing line uh, goes after e4 in this position. Um, and knight f6, bishop to uh, e5, attacking the knight, the knight to d5, taking the pawn, knight drops back, bishop drops back, some developments, a bishop g4, and not blundering the queen, but forcing a draw after these moves. Um, the reason why, here you go, here the line I'm going to be showing today is e3, gaining back the pawn immediately and there is nothing black can can do really to stop or prevent white from taking back this pawn um so the question was okay never mind <laughs> well in this position black usually goes knight f6 but i want to explain to you why I have always played this e3 move. It might seem like a <laughs> it might seem like a bit of a weird explanation, but I will give it to you anyway. Because when I was a little kid, I went to this chess tournament in Greece. This was my second tournament ever, and it was like this international tournament. I was a little kid. I was there with my mom and her boyfriend, and there was a pool and everything was so great. And, you know, I didn't know any openings. I had just started to play chess and they were like really good. So they showed me, they showed me this. They showed me d4, d5, c4. And I was like, what? But white is just giving away a pawn. Why, why can't I just take this pawn as black? So I took the pawn just to say like, you know, I'm going to take this pawn. And then my mom's boyfriend, he said, but here, I'm very sorry. But here, white can go e3. And ever since that day, I've played e3. Because he showed me he showed me this. He said, if... Um, sorry, again. If black here goes b5, then white plays a4. And you know, I didn't understand anything. I was like, this doesn't make sense. This really just doesn't make sense to me. Um, why? Well, the first, the first one is obvious. If... Black here plays a6 to protect the pawn. We of course just take on b5 because there's a nice little pin down here. So if black takes back, we can take the rook. Um, so that's very simple. Black does not want to go a6, but black has this other move, c6. And I was like this, to me it just looks like black won a pawn here. And he said, no, 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 no. Black did not win a pawn. Black is actually losing a piece. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Losing a piece in this position, I do not understand. So he took the pawn on b5 and I took back. Well, of course, black doesn't have to take back here. But if black plays c6, it's probably because black didn't see white's next move. And if, if chat can find the next move here, I would be very happy. Uh, my rating back then was nothing. I didn't have any rating. Um, because the first tournament I played, I lost all my games. So I didn't, you know, I didn't gain any rating. So this tournament I also played without rating. Um, so, 
In this position, white very, very nicely wins a piece with queen f3. And not only is this... Um, well, this mainly highlights why it's so important to develop in the opening phase of the game. Because here, black has spent a whole lot of time just grabbing pawns on c4 and playing b5, just saying, I want that pawn. But in the opening, you have to develop your pieces, otherwise you're going to get in trouble. And this queen f3 move really just displays that. So let's see why. The queen is attacking the rook. And the rook cannot move. So black has to defend this rook somehow, but there's no way to defend the rook. Queen d5 blunders the queen. Knight c6 blunders the knight. Bishop b7 blunders the bishop. And even if you if you even if you move a knight to d7, well the rook is still not protected. So black can just not play like this. And then, then a few years later, because I didn't get to play this little cute opening trap in the tournament I played in Greece, but a few years later, I was playing a tournament in Sweden. And I played d4. Let's just go all the way back. I played d4. My opponent played d5. I played c4, and he took the pawn, and I was like, oof, he has no idea what's coming. He has no idea. So I played e3. And I was like, oh, please play b5, please, please, please. I was still a little kid, you know, I was playing all my hope chess. My opponent played b5 and I was like, yes, finally, someone, finally. I played a4 and I was like, please play c6. He played c6. I took the pawn on b5, he took back and I went queen f3 and I was sitting there enjoying myself as I watched his face suffer from the humiliation of losing a piece on the sixth move against a 13 year old girl. Um, so this was a very satisfying moment for me considering that he was a lot higher rated. And it actually took me quite some time to win the game after this little trap, but I did win the game anyhow. I think we should go we should go quickly back because we do have um we do have a lot of stuff to see here today. For those of you who weren't here in the beginning, we're looking at the Queen's Gambit Acceptus and we're going to follow a game today to understand the strategic ideas behind this opening. And the game is Atalik versus Slipak from Mal del Plata 2003. Both very, very strong GMs rated above 2500. So I'm sure that we can learn a lot here today. So, in this game, between these two strong players, this e3 move also happened. Of course, these very strong GMs, they know this trap, they do not fall for it. They develop their pieces like you're supposed to in the opening. Knight f6. This is the most common move. Um, white just takes back the pawn. You're, you're saying, you know, this is a queen's gambit, but I want to keep my pawn. I, I don't want to lose any pawn in the opening and gambit my way out of this. Let me just take the pawn and I'll play you strategically. So, um, <laughs> how can you get 2500 if you're a 1d4 player? Well, many, many 1d4 players get do get to 2500. I think it's a very solid opening choice and I wouldn't play anything but it. Bishop takes c4. And here, there's this little move a6, and the move a6 is designed uh, to go b5 on the next move, attacking this bishop, planting this bishop on b7, looking at this very nice diagonal. Um, but this move most likely transposes to the main game after knight f3. Here, Black can decide to go b5, but you always, as black, have to be careful. Instead of knight f6, can we play b5? That was the variation, uh, that was the opening trap that I just looked at. If you missed it, don't worry, this video will be uploaded to the Chess24 YouTube and you can go back and look at the game, look at the variation and lines. And I will also be uploading the file here 
uh, today to my Discord server for the subs of my own Twitch channel, uh, Ellen Nilsson, where you can find this game, you can find these comments, and you can find these lines. Um, so if you want that, you can go to my Twitch channel, subscribe, join the uh, Discord server, and then you can find the file here afterwards. Um, but after knight f6, it most likely uh, transposes. Black can indeed go b5, but the most played move is e6, waiting a bit with this b5 move until black is more ready. Because of course, I'm not quite sure that this sacrifice works just yet, but it's always something you have to be careful of. Um, because these kind of tricks, they do very often arise. For example, if black here in this position played, I'm just trying to get that arrow away, I'm so sorry. If black here in this position played bishop g4, then there is this very cute uh, bishop takes f7 trap that you also have to be very mindful of when you're playing against uh, this queen's gambit accepted, because what happens is that the king takes and then there's a difference between whether the knight goes to g5 or e5 here. You have to go to g5 to attack the bishop with both the knight and the queen um, because this knight on f6 is defending it. This is a check, very, very important. Otherwise, we would be losing the queen on d1. So the king would have to drop back. And here, white has won this very, very vital and important pawn on f7. So let's go a little bit back. In this position, the most common move for black to play is e6. It may seem a little strange that black is, is blocking this bishop on c8, but this bishop is not really ready to be developed yet, as we, as we saw in the knight f3, bishop g4 variations. So instead, um, what black does is that I have to really get control of these arrows. Instead, what black does is black is ready to get this bishop out and get the king to safety and try to counter attack in the center. Um, so, and this counter attack in the center is very, very important. White develops naturally. In the opening, we always have to look out for these three. We have three basic and very, very main principles. The first one is that you want to get control over the center. You want your piece to, you want your pieces to look at the center, and you also want your pieces in the center. And the center of, is of course these four squares right here, the center of the board. Then the second rule is that we want to get our minor pieces out. We first want to get our minor pieces out before we get our major pieces out. The minor pieces are the knights and the bishops. So these four we very much like to get out in the opening phase of the game. And then the third, and maybe, well, it's, it's tough to say which of these uh, are the most important uh, principles, but very, very importantly, we need to get the king to safety and we get the king to safety by castling. Um, so knight f3 is doing all of these three things at once. You prepare to castle because you now you can get your king this way. You develop a minor piece. You remember the knight is a minor piece. And the knight is looking at the center. That's also the main difference between the move knight f3 and a move like knight h3. Knight f3, knight h3 does two of these things. Um, it gets the piece out and it gets ready to castle, but this knight is very poorly placed on h3. We can see that from here, it can only go to four squares, um, while and it doesn't look at any of the central squares, while from f3, the knight, we actually call a knight in the center an octopus, because the knight in the center can look at eight squares, it can go to eight squares. Um, so, the knight is just much, much better placed on f3 than it is on h3. Let me just move all of these arrows. There we go. There we go. Here, we follow more main principles of the opening. 
Black makes a counterattack in the center by putting the pawn on c5. An important question to ask here is, of course, what would happen if white took the pawn? Um, but here you have to you have to be a little bit careful because black will take the queen with check and now white has lost the privilege of castling, getting the king to safety and black will get the pawn back immediately afterwards. So we don't want to take the pawn on c5. Um, there's simply just no reason to do it. We want to keep on following the main principles of the opening and we do that by just castling, getting the king to safety. Here, a few, not too well, black has a few options, but the options are very limited, um, even though black has a few and most of them they do transpose. A move like bishop e7 here would basically lose a move for black. White could actually consider taking the pawn now as after queen takes you take back with the rook. Remember we already got the king to safety. Now the rook is taking the file and now black has to use another move to move this bishop and take back the pawn. And something we rather don't want to do in the opening is move the same piece twice. And we see that first black moved the bishop to e7 and then to c5. This we want to avoid um, as black. So that is a consideration you can do after, uh, after bishop e7. Another move is also because this position um, does indeed look a little bit dry. We do have the same pawn structure for black and for white. So we might not be sure to get too much out of this position. Therefore, we could also consider a simple move uh, like queen e2. And queen e2 we will get back to in the main variations. We want to get the rook here to d1 and then develop our pieces naturally. So there's also another move here. Let me just remove this one here. Um, knight c6. And knight c6 also looks very, very logical um, just to develop the piece here. And here, white goes queen e2. And this does look... Um, this does look like it's losing a pawn. Let's say black takes and white takes and black takes and white takes and black takes. We say that white lost a pawn. But we do have ways to improve here. Um, is there any way to stop b6, c5 trap? Mm, I don't know which trap that is. Um, the pawn is already on, on c5 and, and b6 does not seem like a trap to me. It doesn't have any threats in the position. Um, but to get back to this, if black decides to take, we actually do not have to take back immediately. We can play this, we can play this very cute move rook d1. Rook d1 pins this pawn on d4. Um, because if the pawn takes on e3, then we're losing the queen. Um, So after, oh, I'm sorry, after rook d1, black can also try to defend the pawn on e5. Uh, black can try to defend the pawn on d4, but the problem here is that the black king has still not castled. The black king is actually a long way from castling because first you have to move the bishop on c8 and then you have to castle. So in this position, white can just take the pawn on d4 and now we see the e-file opening up for the queen, pointing towards the king. Um, and even if black takes and white takes, they're simply here black just lost a piece because because this pawn is, is just pinned. You don't want to you don't want to lose your pieces like this. So after this black is already in uh, a lot of trouble. So after rook d1 there is no way for black to maintain the pawn on d4 and we will transpose into the main line. 
Um, after knight c6, queen e2, black can also play a6, but this is just a direct transposition, uh, transposition into the main line that we will look at. So the main line here goes a6. And a6 is... Um, of, um, when black tries to defend the c4 pawn in the opening. If there's any way to, to stop that trap. Well, black just shouldn't play b5 after e3. b5 is a, is a bad move. Um, there is one thing, however, I did not show that I was actually planning on showing. I hope I'm not confusing uh, too many people by going a bit back here. If black takes and white plays e3, b5, a4. The move to play here for black is b4. b4 is is the move in this position. And this move has actually been played by some uh, some strong players. There's some very, very strong players in the world who has tried this move, but I would not recommend it. Um, if you are playing as black and if you're playing as white, you shouldn't be worried about this move. You should just try to develop your pieces naturally, Get put them on nice squares pointing towards the center, get your king to safety and this b4 move will not really, um, or it shouldn't really uh, make you too worried. Yes, the b4 pawn is uh, a long way up the board, but black is also going against some of the main principle of, principles of the opening, just moving the pawns all the time, not developing uh, the pieces. And black also at some point has to spend time on defending this pawn on b4 as it will be attacked. Um, I keep on doing that, that's not good. Okay, sorry. So here, the line we were looking at, the main line, um, knight f3, c5, black attacks the center, white castles, black plays a6, and in this position, or usually when we play chess, not usually, all the time when we play chess, we should try to, um, after b4, yes, you do take the c4 pawn, that's how you, you start by taking the c4 pawn and then you, then you keep on your normal play. When we play chess, we want to look at the opponent's ideas. What does the opponent want? And in this position, it is not difficult to see this a6 move. Our opponent is not hiding their intentions. They want to go b5. So let's stop that move. Let's play a4. a4 is directly stopping this b5 move because now if black decides to play b5, we can just take it. And once again, we see the problems of not having developed your pieces early in the game. Um, this a6 move does have some purpose. First of all, it's trying to provoke this a4 move because usually in the kind of positions uh, that we get, that I will explain in a second, the pawn would rather want to be on a3. This a4 move is a little bit more weakening than if the pawn was on a3. And it's also stopping all kinds of bishop b5 check ideas in the future. Um, so it's a little bit of a sneaky move, but a4 is very solid. Black has a few, or no, here black plays knight c6, uh, develops the knight and attacks the center. Now we play this queen e2 move. Um, and this is the same as we saw in the line before. If black takes the pawn, we play rook d1. And there's still no way for black uh, in this position to keep the pawn on d4. The lines are exactly the same. We just included these moves, a4 and a6. But I will just show them uh, quickly again to, to recap, also if someone did not see them. Of course, you cannot take this pawn on e3 as the queen on d8 is hanging. If you play e5, we see the troubles of not having castled and not having gotten your king to safety early in the opening. And white can just take this pawn, opening up for the queen. There is no way to take this pawn in here because white just has too many pieces attacking that square and here. Black actually just lost an entire queen, which we very, very much want to uh, avoid. 
So there is no way for black to keep this pawn. You can of course, uh, in this position, try to go bishop c5. But bishop c5 we do not like. And the reason for that is still this pin. This pin is very annoying really really incredibly annoying and this also shows why in the opening sometimes you shouldn't be too hung up to just take take pawns everywhere because when you take a pawn you usually have to spend some time hanging on to that pawn first you have to spend a move taking the pawn then you have to spend a move defending the pawn or you have to spend a move uh, getting a piece back after it's been attacked. Taking a pawn requires a lot of time and a lot of energy. And in this position, black just, just does not have the time and the energy to take the pawn because of the unsafe king and the pin along the d file. Um, here, white can just take the pawn on d4. And not strangely i would say i think it's very um it's very easy to understand that black in this position is just losing a piece because if black takes with the knight white can take with the knight black takes with the bishop and here we have this very very cute move bishop e3 we are just developing a piece putting more pressure on the d4 pawn and again now we see why this king has to be castled because we can take the bishop and the pawn is pinned on e5 and there is simply just no other way to defend the bishop on d4. Um, white does not have any loose pieces in the position for for black to create a counter attack against. So also a move like queen b6 and you just you lose the bishop. Um, and if you start by taking with the bishop, well then bishop e3 comes again. And it's the same story. There's just, you can take with the bishop or the knight here, it doesn't really matter. And it's the same story, um, black is losing a piece. So you don't want the bishop in this position to go to c5 because white will take the pawn and you have to spend another move uh, moving the bishop. So in this position, what black usually does is bishop e7. Black understands that he has, he or she has to castle and get the king to safety. And now white takes with the pawn. And here we get, um... <laughs> here, I just read a comment about ferociously attacking and then, uh, then I call it a cute move. Well, I do think that it's a cute move. Um, and here we have a very nice and strategic position. Here, black, here, white, sorry, gets an isolated pawn on d4. And an isolated pawn is a pawn that cannot be defended by any other pawns in the position. Um, and as we can see here, black also has some ideas of blocking it. And what I really, really like about these isolated pawns are all the, it's all the play they create in the position. Because if you put this in an engine, it will say that black probably equalized in this position. But these kind of positions with the isolated pawns, they are so filled with strategic, positional, dynamic ideas that you want to, or that you can try to understand and use. And these positions are not easy to play for anyone um, and many players have spent many many hours studying these kind of positions and um, and i think they are absolutely lovely to play so the idea of this isolated pawn is that the isolated pawn is usually weak but with the isolated pawn you also get more space because the isolated pawn is in the center. And when you have a pawn or a piece in the center, um, it takes some squares away from the opponent, which makes it easier for you to move your pieces around. So even though the pawn is weak, it creates space. It creates ways for you to arrange your pieces more naturally than your opponent. What black wants to do 
<laughs> well, there's actually quite a few famous sayings. Um, you want to block the pawn. And then after you block the pawn, you want to take it. Um, a few ideas for white here is that you can create an attack on the king. This king will, uh, will castle soon. Or you sometimes push the pawn. And this pawn push can be quite dangerous for the opponent because firstly white gets rid of the weakness because d4 is a weakness and if black manages to consolidate the position and grab the pawn then then black is just a pawn up but a move like d5 gets rid of the weakness and sometimes it opens very very nice play for your pieces um, right here it's of course bad uh, firstly it's black to move secondly you would just drop the pawn and we don't really want to drop the pawn we also want to keep it for dynamic chances black castles white develops uh the knight very nicely here and in the game i know we don't have a lot of time left i've just spent so much time explaining i'm so sorry um in the game in this position black played knight d5 because black thought let me try to block this pawn before it gets any more dynamic play in the position. White developed a piece with bishop d2. Black thought, okay, let me play b6, try to get this bishop out. Um, where it first points at the d5 square, taking more control of this square. And also just looks down at white's position. Here white played a nice move, knight e5. And knight e5 is a, is a very nice move, which shows one of the strengths of the isolated pawn, which is the space and the squares it takes in the center. I just need some tea, I'm sorry. This knight on e5 is very well placed, centralized, looking, as I said before, it's an octopus when it is in the center. It takes so many squares. So this knight is very, very nice. Um, something white could also have tried in this position was maybe just to take this knight and after pawn takes bishop b3. White is a little better here, uh, not a lot. We have a symmetrical pawn structure um, in the center and on the king side. On the queen side, it's a little more unbalanced, but it shouldn't. this shouldn't be enough for white to win. So white correctly went for knight e5. And black agreed this knight was very very annoying so he took it um something black also could have done was taking this knight after b takes we have a we have another pawn structure which can also arise from the isolated pawn and this pawn structure is called hanging pawns and hanging pawns they have some of the same strategic ideas as the isolated pawn um they give you more space but they're also a little bit weak sometimes you want to push them sometimes you want to keep them back sometimes you want to create an attack there's a lot of ways to play um i don't think white would have taken with the pawn i think white would have taken with the bishop and after a uh, knight takes e5 d takes e5 Black actually does not have the same kind of problems that black had in the game. Um, but this can still look, from, from the black side, uh, this can look very dangerous, even though objectively the position is probably equal. Because we see that the, the white pieces, they're, they're quite nicely placed. They're pointing at the king. Um, this rook is ready to get into the game. It, it can look dangerous, um, but here black is not uh, experiencing the same problems as in the game. Because in the game, black also took the knight on e5. And after d takes e5, uh, we have the same pawn structure as shown before, but, but black's pieces are a little bit more loose here. And now black already made a blunder, bishop b7. This is a very natural looking move, um, but this is just showing how even for very, very strong players, these positions 
coming out of this opening they can they can be quite tough to play and here white found an excellent move queen g4 just getting this queen to this very very nice square pointing at the king which actually does not have many pieces to protect it you can see that this pawn on e5 is doing a great job um, preventing this knight from coming back into the defense um, these pieces are, are not really looking at any of the important squares because white usually attacks on the light squares um, and the bishop cannot come to f6 to defend either if black here plays g6 black has already weakened the king so 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 much um, i believe this position is probably it stops the queen from pointing at g7 but you weaken these squares so much you really weaken them and i think white is pretty much just winning here I think uh, a very simple win could be taking this knight. Um, if pawn takes, then you go e6. And now you're already starting to break up this pawn shield in front of the king. If bishop takes, then you take with the knight. If pawn takes, then you go e6. Once again, the same idea. And if queen takes, then you have this very nice bishop h6 discovered attack against the queen and attacking the rook on f8, winning an exchange. Um, so you should always be very careful when pushing pawns in front of uh, in front of the queen, uh, in front of the king, because when you push pawns in front of the king, you you create weaknesses. Um, of course, you want space and you want air for your king, but you should also be careful about which pawns push. Um, here black played queen c7 and white played this once again extremely strong move why not take on d4 after knight e5 oh here okay so this pawn seems to be hanging but the pawn is not hanging and i can tell you why I think it's actually an interesting question. I did not look at this, but I assume queen e4 is completely demolishing the black position. Um, I do not see what, what black can do here. This seems like a very strong move. Centralizing the queen, attacking the knight, pointing at the king, attacking this knight with a lot of pieces getting ready to move this bishop somewhere, unleashing the rook against the queen. You should always be careful about taking pawns when you haven't developed your pieces. I think this is very, very good for white. Um, and here, this very, very thematic, uh, thematic capture in the opening is when the, knight, when the bishop takes the knight on d5. Um, and it, it could seem weird to give a knight for the give a bishop for the knight here but there is a difference taking with the knight is not as good because when black takes back with the pawn then black is attacking the bishop on c4 and as we see in the game um this recapture was very bad for black here, if white goes bishop h6 to, uh, to um, threaten mate, black has this queen e5 move, defending the mate on g7. White can play rook e1 to attack the queen. The black queen has to keep on uh, protecting this g7 square, so the queen can go to f6. And now if the rook takes on e7, of course the queen cannot take back, as then there would be a mate on g7. But because this bishop is hanging, as we talked about before, black can take it. And this bishop on h6 is also hanging with the queen. Um, so this would be an approximately uh, equal, well, this would be an equal position after queen takes c4. But in the game, because the bishop on c4 wasn't hanging, black got into very deep trouble after bishop takes d5. 
Here, if e takes d5, we see the difference from knight takes d5, because the bishop isn't hanging. After bishop h6, queen takes e5, rook e1, queen f6, rook takes e7. Now, black is losing a piece. You can't take, still because of the mate. And if you take on h6, then the bishop on b7 is hanging. So, there was a big, big difference between taking with the knight and taking with the bishop. And after bishop takes, then knight takes and e takes. And white played this very nice move, just protecting the pawn on e5. And also not only protecting the pawn on e5, pointing at the king. This e6 idea is very, very strong in the position. Um, just pushing the pawn trying to make the king on g8 a little bit more weak and also threatening mate. Black played rook fd8 and here e6 was extremely strong for white. Um, a few natural looking moves could be a move like bishop f8 but after bishop f8 the strong bishop f6 comes. Of course the g-pawn is pinned as the king would then be hanging if the rook moved to e8 to attack the pawn, then e7 would win exchange because the bishop cannot take as there is a mate on g7. So the rook would have, and the bishop is trapped, the bishop has nowhere to go. So the rook would have to take, but then bishop takes and white is an exchange up. And after rook d6 in this position, e7. Not e7, no, I'm so sorry. h4. Not h7, I'm so sorry. Bishop e5. Got it right there. Sorry about that one. I confused myself a little bit about some of these variations. Bishop e5, very, very simple. Winning another or winning an exchange also in this variation. So after e6, um, and also remember that you cannot take it because there is a mate on g7. So after e6, black would have to play f6. And this is just a horrendous position for a black. This king is so weak. And, and in this position, white can play uh, h4. And you can see <laughs> you can see my beautiful arrows here that I drew already. The bishop is pointing at the king. The pawn is moving up the board. This rook can come to c1 or d1. This rook can go up and over to d3 and to g3. This position is busted. There is no other way to say it. Um, but white did not play this move. White played another lat natural looking move. Oops. Rook d3. Simple chess. White wanted to, um, to mate. But this was not as strong and as uh, f6 because of an incredible move uh, by black here. That black did not find either. Very tough move to spot, but this was a very nice uh, defensive resource. And the defensive resource is queen c4, simply just trying to exchange the queens. Um, and now if the rook goes to d4, then queen c6, and the queen is protecting the sixth rank. And the rook is not as well placed on d4 as on d3, because it doesn't have the same nice squares on d4 as it, as it did on d3. So... So queen c4 was a very nice defensive resource that uh, that black did not find. Black played bishop f8. Um, and finally now white played e6. It is not as strong as before um, for, for reasons that I don't have time to go into. Um, white could also have considered rook a d1, something that wasn't possible before. Just putting some pressure on the weak pawn on d5 because now black is the one sitting with an isolated pawn but black does not have the same opportunities with this isolated pawn as as white did in the beginning with his or her isolated pawn because here there's no way for black to start an attack pushing this pawn is not going to help anything and this pawn is just weak um white can attack it black cannot defend it white played e6 Queen e7, uh, rook e1, bringing all the pieces into play. 
this is something we very much often or this is something we always want to do when we attack we want all our pieces in the attack you know you have to bring all the guests to the party right now we have corona so that unfortunately that's not possible but when we play chess we want all the pieces we want all our friends there um so rookie won a good move rook d6 Black actually found some very nice defensive moves in this position, even though the position was indeed looking difficult. Um, white took the pawn on f7. And what this does is that it weakens the black king even more. Because we can see here, white has three pawns in front of the king. Black only has two. And this can make a huge difference in a game because the king is the most important piece. And now we see that both the king and the d5 pawn is weak. So black has two weaknesses in the position. White played queen d1, and I can see that I have to be a little bit faster. I don't have time to go through all of this. Oh, I spent too much time talking. I'm so sorry. Um, let's go through the game quickly from here because we are um, we are away from the opening phase, and the opening phase was, of course, the most important part of today, talking about the Queen's Gambit accepted. So let me just show the rest of the game here. Um, Queen d1, putting pressure on the d5 pawn, protecting the d5 pawn. And here, both the players, they shuffled around a bit. They were trying to improve their positions. In this position, White had a killer blow that he did not find. The move Queen d3 double exclamation mark it is not obvious why this move is so good this move is actually just incredible it, it would be very very tough to see over the board and it's understandable that white did not find this move um white is attacking the pawn on a5 if the pawn moves white will centralize the bishop and after a natural looking move like bishop c5 attacking the queen and then queen a6 and now we see why it's so important to have pawns around your king um because this king is too weak the whole back rank is weak this diagonal is weak so um so black is in huge trouble here and actually just losing A move like queen d6 does not save the game because white can take this one and um after b takes the pawn on a5 is hanging sorry oops oh no the pawn on a5 is hanging this is just uh this is a very um uh this is a line with a lot of natural moves for both players just showing how strong queen d3 is they played a bit around um and then eventually black blundered after being under pressure for so long because of course in this position it is white who is pushing black's king is weak and the d5 pawn is weak and black blundered with queen e4 um at first sight it looks like it's just losing a piece it's actually not it's losing a queen end game and this this happens sometimes when you're under pressure either black misevaluated the end game or black just didn't um or just didn't see all these tactics maybe black was in time pressure we don't know it is 17 years ago take the bishop black took the rook a check white picked up the rook black picked up the bishop and now White gave a check and took the pawn on b6. This was all very fast, I'm so sorry. Um, but this queen end game is winning for white and white won it flawlessly. Um, I will just show the lines here. And after this, black could not stop this pawn from promoting. There are no, or there is no um, perpetual with queen d5 as the king goes to h2. I am pretty sure. The king goes, no, the king probably goes to g1 here first. Um, not that it makes much difference. And white will queen next move. So in this position, black simply resigned. So remember that I will upload this entire file to my Discord server from my own Twitch channel. You have to be a subscriber. I will put it in the sub lounge, as we call it. 
You can find my Twitch at Ellen Nilsson. I will go live on there in about five minutes when I just get some water. I hope that you enjoyed today. Um, I hope that you enjoyed today and that you thought it was instructional, that you feel like you can use some of this that I showed in your own games. Remember that this video will be uploaded to the Chess24 YouTube channel, so you can rewatch it as many times as you want. If you do not have access to the file, you can of course um, put the put the moves in your own chess base, on your own Lee Chess, on your own chess.com, whatever you want. I hope that you uh, understood what I uh, was explaining, that you found this strategic idea ideas nice and that you like the line I picked for you to to learn today. I really myself do love these isolated pawns positions. I feel like they they give a lot of opportunities they uh to to each player um playing the game. So thank you everyone so much for today. I have enjoyed it. I will also let me just say before everyone leaves, I will also tomorrow be doing um another lesson here on um the twitch youtube channel and on the coaches twitch channel tomorrow it will be about learning from kasparov so we will be watching a very very nice attacking game from kasparov i cannot wait for you to see this great game we won't go into as much detail about the opening so tomorrow it's more about why kasparov he was so good at and how we can learn from him Thank you, everyone. It's also at 8 p.m. tomorrow, uh, CET, Central European Standard Time.